I grew up across the country and really kind of around the world. I was a child of a man who was in the U.S. Navy, uh, and he met my mother uh, in the Philippines back in the early 1970s, in the last century for you kids. <laughs> and uh, as we were going around the world, uh, I learned a lot of different things. Uh, we were stationed primarily in the, the southern part of the United States uh, through most of my father's uh, naval career. Uh, we did do some time on the island of Guam, uh, but we got exposed to a lot of different cultures. Uh, my father, however, was originally from the state of Maine, uh, and so when we moved back there, they have a reputation uh, in New England, like here in Minnesota, everybody's Minnesota nice, you know, that, that's all going on. My wife and I get to go to a Timberwolves game this week, and we watched the Boston Celtics, and so I was wearing my, my being from Maine, I'm, I'm a Celtics fan, uh, and so I was wearing a Celtics jersey, a sweatshirt and a hat and everything, and there's a few fans who were going, boo, 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 but you know, most of all, people were pretty polite to us, you know, they, they weren't like, we weren't getting into fisticuffs or anything like this. They said, we, we beat your team in overtime, ha-ha, but you know, it was, all, it was all friendly, and Timberwolves look pretty good this year, folks, I gotta say. Uh, but anyways, so we're going through this, and everybody gets along. You know, there, there's an effort to kind of smooth things over, let's all be even keel, let's be tolerant of one another. You go to Maine, and it's not quite the same way. People... It, it, there, you, you don't have to wonder what people think because they will tell you very bluntly. Uh, my grandmother, uh, my father's mother, uh, it, it actually frustrated my mother uh, at first. She came over here uh, as an older teenager. They were uh, married when my, my dad was like in his early 20s and my mom was uh, 18, 19 years old. And, and so they come over and she's trying to get acclimated to a new culture and everything. And my, my grandmother was not one, she, she was very kind, but she was not one to mince words. Uh, so she, she gave very direct opinions, direct input into her life on how she needed to adjust to the culture. And oftentimes my mother felt like it was criticism, like there was uh, different things that were going on. They worked the, their things out uh, over time, and, and now uh, they, they've been family for much longer uh, than at that point that she'd been alive. But it was a hard adjustment to make, the directness in the culture. But there's also something that's helpful to that, because at the same time, you don't have to wonder. It, it can be a little bit jarring, a little bit off-putting. My first uh, t uh, church that I was the lead pastor in uh, was in Skowhegan, Maine. And my wife, Jennifer, was a Midwesterner. She wasn't Minnesota nice, but she was Michigan. I don't know what they are in Michigan, but <laughs> they're, they're pretty nice too. But that was an adjustment for her to make as well, to figure out the culture. But she also grew, I think, <laughs> to appreciate some of that as well, that there was a, a kind of candor, a kind of input that she could understand was being clear uh, and was helpful in our communication. What we're going to see in the text this morning is Paul has, so I don't know if Paul was from Maine or not, but Paul knew how to be direct. In fact, we're going to see at the, the conclusion of the chapter here this morning, he had the gift of being direct to the point of making Felix, the Roman governor who he's uh, having an audience with and making his defense in front of this morning, quite uncomfortable with how we might be able to say how blunt he was being. But it was also important for Paul to speak the truth. And as Christians, we, I don't want to encourage you to be blunt and mean-spirited. We should be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Why? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. But we also understand there are times where in our culture... It is appropriate and necessary not to soft sell it, but to speak the truth directly, even as we do what John says, to speak truth in love. What Paul does here this morning is speak truth directly, and we're going to see how we go about doing that here as we examine the text this morning. Acts chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, I'm reading this morning from the English Standard Version. Hear the word of God. Luke writes, after five days, the high priest Ananias came down, taking a pause here for a moment. You remember last week, there was a threat 
on Paul's life. And so they have moved him from the prison where he was in Jerusalem to a safer location. That's where we're picking up in the narrative. So he is, after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid out before the governor, that's Felix, their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Phoenix, Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. When the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than twelve days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which, with the, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia... They ought to be here before you and to make an accusation, should they have anything else against me. Or else, let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing, that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, that's another term they're using to describe Christianity here, the way, Put them off, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Hear the word of God. Verse 24 is going to kind of serve as an outline for what we're going to cover out of the passage this morning, where it says there in verse 24 of the chapter, or verse 25 rather, uh, after Paul is called in front of Felix and Drusilla, his wife, more on her in a moment, but Paul reasons with Felix about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. Righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment judgment. On your outline that you have on the back of your bulletin, this helps us understand, first of all, that it is God who has established righteousness. God has established righteousness. What we're going to call when he talks about Paul reasoning through with righteousness is we're going to focus on, first of all, God having established regulations. Regulations. We'll alliterate here and make it a nice uh, smooth R uh, following through. But the idea that God has established the truth of his law. And Paul is posing himself with all these accusations that the Jews are making against him that contrary to what they're saying, that I'm a disruptive influence, that I am inconsistent, that I have uh, 
not come into the temple pure, that I have desecrated the temple. He says, you look at how Paul describes himself. I have not desecrated the temple. I went through all the rites of purification. I went through all the things that were necessary in order for me to enter the temple. I was following the principles to the letter of the law. The point Paul is trying to make to them and to Felix against his accusers is that I am doing everything I can to be an upstanding citizen, to live consistently with the expectations both of the Roman government and the Jewish religious law as I go into the temple. I am not trying to dishonor anything. I'm trying to be a good citizen because that's what I should do before God. I believe in the God who has established the law. I follow His law. And that's the same law that they are trying to accuse me of having disrupted, having gone against. Now, we today as believers, unlike Paul, do not tend to go uh, and follow all the Jewish religious ceremonial laws. There are people who have found some benefit in that, and I don't think that's absolutely necessary according to Scripture. God does not require that of us today as New Testament believers. By the way, I also don't think Paul thought that God required it of him. He told the Jews, uh, or he told the Gentiles rather, as he is evangelizing them, that it is not necessary. And you remember the Jerusalem Council where they drew the conclusion, and he re reestablishes that with James as he's coming to Jerusalem that they aren't supposed to eat anything that has been strangled, they're not supposed to eat blood, and they're supposed to abstain from sexual immorality. In other words, he's saying, you don't have to keep all these feast days. You don't have to go through all these things. You don't have to eat kosher. You don't have to do all these things. These are the ways that you as Gentile believers can still sincerely follow God. But Paul is Jewish. So Paul is worshiping God, and he's preaching God to the Gentiles. He has embraced and believed the truth of Jesus Christ. But he's also been raised ethnically and culturally as a Jewish man. And what he's endeavoring to do is to be true to his roots. There is nothing unbiblical or disobedient about Paul observing these things any more than it would be for you. It would not be sinful for you, even you as a Gentile believer to decide I'm going to go on a kosher diet. There would be nothing wrong with that even though there would be nothing sinful about you going home today and enjoying a nice ham sandwich and pulled pork. That's all great, too. I think that's what we're going to do today, isn't it, Jennifer? You, you're welcome to come over. <laughs> but this is what... Jennifer's like, no, no, no. <laughs> but this is not a matter of moral disobedience or immorality when it comes to this. Paul is saying, and the New Testament church has taught, this is something that... You, this, is where, this is how you live. This is the freedom that you have. But there was nothing wrong with Paul keeping the law, keeping and observing these practices as he did. That being the case, there are things that Christians ought to continue to fulfill. And you remember, sometimes in the Gospels, some people come to Jesus, and Jesus says, what are the things that you have learned? How do you uh, curry favor with God effectively. And he says, well, we can reduce it to two things. Jesus will say this later on in Matthew 22, verse 39, when somebody asks him, what, what does God require of you? He says, the first is, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then the second commandment, wrote Matthew 22, 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes people told that to Jesus. In this case, Jesus is telling others. This is how the expectation is for God, from God for humanity. What are those two commandments summarizing? Love God and rub your love your neighbor. They are an effective summary of the Ten Commandments, the two tablets that God gives. The first four have to do with people's relationship with God, not having any other gods before him. He is the only God. We are not to have any graven images. We are to remember the Sabbath day. Those are all things about reverencing and respecting God, fearing him. But then the final six, the second tablet, 
has to do with what it looks like to love our neighbors. So we don't steal, we don't kill, we don't murder in that case, we, we don't commit adultery, we honor our father and mother, we respect those in authority, we don't covet. That is, we remain content with what we have. We understand that God has given these things to us. And that really informs what a Christian's conduct and behavior still ought to be, even though we're not in the New Old Testament anymore. We're in a different dispensation. We're in a different age. We're in the age of grace. And you say, well, Pastor, there is nothing that we see in Scripture, some have argued, that means that we have to keep the law. God has fulfilled all the righteousness in Jesus Christ. Yes, that's true. No one, none of us, as we're going to see in Galatians, are justified by the deeds of the law. But John will also tell us in his epistle that if we love God, if we are in Him, we aren't going to sin. And what is sin? How is sin defined? John says sin is lawlessness. Sin is living without any kind of structure. God didn't come so that you could live a wanton, immoral life. God wants you in your life, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, He has established law for the betterment of society. What Paul is saying is, I am living an upstanding moral life. I am not the disruptor that they are accusing me of. In fact, I'm doing everything I can to live within the framework, within the structure that God has ordained. As Christians today, that should be true of us as well. There should be no opportunity for people to make accusations against us that stick when it comes to our behavior, when it comes to our conduct with other people. We should be living exemplary lives. We should be some of the most tolerant, some of the most accommodating people that there are out in society. That being said, how come Christians tend to get painted with that brush of being intolerant, of, of not allowing people freedoms and liberties? Well, let's think through that a little bit. Why in the whole attitude of society today do we get criticized? Why do Christians tend to get painted with a condemnatory stripe because we are willing to speak out against sexual promiscuity. Well, it's a, one, we could say it's against God's commands. But two, how much pain and carelessness and hopelessness is perpetuated because mom and dad don't stay faithful, don't stay committed to each other. When we reduce sexuality to an expression of personal pleasure, personal experience, that creates all kinds of problems. It perverts God's intention. The reason God says don't commit adultery, remain faithful, is not because He's trying to curb your fun, curb your pleasure and enjoyment. He is trying to create, He has created, not trying, He has created these structures for the betterment of a society so that children can be raised in a way that they're going to be cared for, protected, they won't be wards of the state, that they are going to be cared for by a mother and father who love them. They're going to be taught to obey God's commands and honor, respect, and obey as the way that God intended. So for a Christian to say this is an insistent thing, that this is how I'm going to live, sometimes can get us painted in an intolerant light. How should we process those things? More on that as we continue to go on. But first of all, friend, I would remind us here that we are to be spending more energy on making sure our marriages are sound, making sure that we are being faithful. And one of the reasons... We can often criticize Christianity in our society today 
is because the sad thing is, many Christians say one thing and live another way. When you look at churches like ours and we see what the divorce rate is, we see what the promiscuity rate is, we see the problems that people have struggling with sexual sin. Often they're sadly not much different than the statistics that the world has. Christian, do better. If we say that we love God and we hate His law, we don't live according to it. That's a problem. There, we're going to see that not only puts you out of fellowship with God, it can create relative uncertainty in your eternal standing. But we must understand that God wants us to have a reputation, to build on a reputation for being good neighbors, good citizens. He has given us these laws, these expectations, these regulations, even as he also, as Paul confronts Felix, desires us to live with a measure of restraint. That's part of what we understand. That's the next point on your outline. Restraint is having these impulses, having these desires that can have a good fulfillment, like we just talked about, sexual impulses, sexual desires. That's a good thing that God has created us with. But it's also something that needs to be directed. You are not supposed to love everyone sexually in the same way. You're supposed to focus that on your spouse. That's the proper and only way that God has intended that kind of a relationship to be understood. And when we don't do that, we are lacking restraint. We are not having control. There's a very vivid example of that actually right here in this passage as you explore some of the details between Felix and Drusilla. Felix, the Roman governor, and his wife Drusilla that's mentioned here in verse 24. You see in the text, Luke says, she was Jewish. Felix is a Roman. Now, who are these people? The text doesn't give us too much about it, but when we explore outside of the text, we explore historians of the day. Many of you would probably recognize the name Josephus, who was a contemporary of the disciples, contemporary of Jesus' day, but he was not a Christian. He was a Jewish historian, and we have many of his writings still available to us to check. He tells us that Drusilla was the daughter of Herod Antipas, and we have seen different Herods throughout our study of the book of Acts. You would probably, many of you, recognize the name Herod going all the way back to Luke chapter 2 when Jesus is born. There are several different monarchs uh, over this Jewish territory who are named Herod. This one is the one who we see who is probably responsible uh, in the oversight of the death of Stephen and other things like this. By the time we are introduced to Drusilla, she is 14 years old when she marries another Roman governor. Uh, and so she is a, a young child bride, but she's considered very attractive, and there's, there's all kinds of sordid things going on. Felix comes upon her, and the story that Josephus tells finds her attractive and actually seduces her away from her husband, uh, gets into an illicit affair, uh, and eventually ends up marrying her. She becomes his third wife. You know, it, it's the kind of thing that we might see portrayed on cable television today uh, as the real housewives of Jerusalem or something. I don't know what, what would be going on there. But it, it's not a pretty tale, but it's the reality of which they're living in. Felix gives in to his impulses, pursues her, woos her, wins her. But now, here's this theologian, here's this rabble-rouser talking to him about God's law, talking to him about self-control, and you see what Felix says. He's alarmed. He wants him to go away. You're making me uncomfortable. You're making me feel guilty. Why? Because the truth the directness of what Paul is saying convicted him to his very heart. The conscience that God has created us with helps us to understand that there is something wrong when we deviate away. And that's one of the reasons 
why, even in a society like ours today, people can be so hostile, so defensive when it comes out. Even you don't have to say things. I've, I've gotten into conversations with people uh, who I know are living a certain way. I, I actually happened to get into one uh, on the way home from the Celtics game the other day. I'm wearing a, uh, my, my, my Celtics stuff, and there's some other guys there, and I, we're having a conversation about the Celtics and things, and he, he lets out some words that people typically wouldn't say in front of a Baptist preacher. Let's just put it that way. And I let known. He said, so what do you do? I said, I live in Rochester. I'm a pastor of a Baptist church. And immediately you could tell he's like, I probably shouldn't have said those words. <laughs> but we, we kept talking. And, and there, there, was a, there was an immediate sense of ownership. There was an immediate sense of, we could maybe say, guilt. Because he knew he had done something that he shouldn't have done. Whether he was really thinking they were bad words or he didn't want to offend me. We can talk about the details of that at some point. But here, what we do know is that people have a sensitivity. People have a conscience. And whether it's language that we speak or not conforming to God's expectations of morality and so forth, these are things that society knows. God has written the law, Paul says in Romans chapter 2, on the fleshly tablets of their heart. They have a sense, even if they didn't grow up with the Bible, if they didn't grow up with any kind of religious expectations, if you will, there are things that we know inherently, whether it's sexual morality, we know we don't kill people, this kind of thing. There is that expectation. And Christians, by the way, are not immune to this struggle either. We know what we should do, but we don't always live consistently with it. I just mentioned in passing Romans chapter 2. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 and verse 21. Paul says it this way, I know what the law is, but I don't want to do it. I'm just summarizing here. He says, I find, verse 21, that to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I delight in the law of God in my inner being. I, this is really what I want to do. I know it's right. But he says, verse 23, I see in my members, that is, in how I feel and how I live in my body, another law waging war against the law of my mind, what I know I should do, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Again, in my body. I says, I know that this is what I should do, but I want to do this. And again, that, that can play itself out in any number of different ways. Maybe it's not controlling yourself. You know, you know I shouldn't lose my cool, but I do. Because inside I can just feel the tension rising, I can feel my temperature rising, and duh, I just got to let it go. I'm by myself, and nobody's there, and it's been a while, and... It's just so available, and so nobody's looking, and I'm going to go on that site. I know I shouldn't. I'm going to look at images I shouldn't. These are the things, friends, that Paul is talking about. I know what I should do, but I have something in me that's making it hard. It's making me struggle. So verse 24, he says, I'm a wretched man. I am trapped. I'm slaved. Who will set me free? He says, verse 25, how do we get free of that? It's through Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Through Jesus Christ, you can set me free. One of the fruits of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians is what the King James Old English says, temperance. In some of your newer translations, it says self-control, self-restraint. God knows that we have that tendency to want to disobey him, to go against his law. Through the Spirit, he gives us the strength, the power to say no. Self-restraint is something that God wants for us. We know his law, and he has given us, friend, the power to keep his law. But when we don't, when we disobey his law, this is the third thing that Paul 
talks about to Felix. It makes him uncomfortable. He says the coming judgment, or what I'm calling here, righteousness is regulation, restraint, and now retribution. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, which we mentioned earlier. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. So, everybody thinks they're their own moral authority and everybody else is not measuring up. Well, he says, all of us are guilty. And here he makes the case. You say, only God judges me? Paul says, you're right. And that's not a good thing. Verse 2. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things, those who disobey the law. Verse 3. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? And as he continues down that passage, he is making the emphasis that, yes, there is coming a day where everyone is going to stand before God and give account of what he or she has done and lived inconsistently with God's law. Skipping down to verse 6. He will render to each one according to his works. Keep reading in verse 8. Those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, for them there will be wrath. There will be fury. John records this in, John, in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 20, what we often refer to as the great white throne judgment. Taken from verse 11 when John says, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. And then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. The reality that made Felix very uncomfortable was when Paul starts to talk to him about God knows what you have done, whether he went into detail or not. Felix knew what he had done. Felix knew that he could not stand before God guiltless, perfect. He knew what he was guilty of. The reality is, that's something that's also part of the gospel message. It's not just that Jesus Christ came to save us. We have to tell people, He came to save us from our sin. And yes, all of us are sinners. All of us have disobeyed God's law. All of us deserve God's just, righteous wrath. His punishment for how we have gone against Him. God is going to evaluate everyone for what they have done, as John says here in Revelation. But the hope, friends, is this. Even though every single one of us has disobeyed God and deserves eternal condemnation in hell and the lake of fire for what we have done, even John gives us a glimpse of hope here in the passage that we've just read. Look at verse 15. After death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire, the second death in verse 14, what, who is cast into the lake of fire? Verse 15. Anyone's name that was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You say, well, how is that hopeful? How is that helpful? Because it doesn't say anyone who was not found to be perfect. It doesn't say anyone who was found to be sinful it gets cast into the lake of fire. It says no. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life. How are we written in the book of life? Who gets to escape eternal wrath and condemnation? Friends, it's those who have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's those for whom Jesus has given His life and says, whoever believes in Me will not pass into condemnation, but will pass from death to life. This is what is available to you through Jesus Christ. Felix was focusing on the reality of his own sin. He 
wasn't tuned in to what Jesus had done for you. It, he describes himself here in Acts chapter 24 as being familiar with the way, but he would not humble himself to hear that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, and no one could come to God. No one could escape that wrath and retribution except through Jesus. But this is what Paul wants us to know. This is what I want you to know today, friends, is that the only way to escape that is, if we're going to the next point on your outline, to live like Jesus. Okay, well, wait a minute. How does that work? Why does God care so much about what I do? I thought it was you were saying that there was nothing that I could do to get into heaven. There was nothing I could do to earn God's forgiveness. Absolutely true. But God does want us to live in an orderly way. We've already established that. He's given us the power to do so. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. He wants us to live like Jesus so that we can enjoy a peaceful society. When he tells us to pray in 1 Timothy chapter 2, why does he say that we should pray for kings, for the government, for all the leaders and those who are in authority? That we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. He wants us to be the. Peter says the same thing in his epistle, that he doesn't want us to stand out as troublemakers, as busybodies. We ought to fear God. We ought to honor the king. We ought to submit ourselves to those in authority. He says in verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 4, Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But no one, let no one suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, a meddler. He says that's how you should be standing out, according to good behavior. Don't stand out for wrong behavior. We want a peaceful society. Christian, you need to be part of a peaceful society. But you also need to look at God's righteousness, look at the standard that he's put up, and realize that this is the way you're going to enjoy, what I'm going to say next is, a perfect spirit. You want to do it for a peaceful society, but you want to live this way so that you can experience peace with God. Which is not the same as saying, this is how you get saved. We're understanding here that those who are saved are going to keep a fellowship, are going to keep a right relationship with God, the way that they live. Listen to what John says in his epistle in 1 John chapter 2. My little children, he's saying, towards the end of his life, he's an elder statesman, he is a respected Christian leader, and he says to the church that he's writing to, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. That's the default position that Christians should enjoy. That's the default position we ought to live by. And if we don't live that way, something is off. But, John says, if something goes off, don't lose hope. Keep reading. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Somebody to defend us. And who is that? Jesus Christ, the righteous. The one who was perfect. The one who was sinless. The one who bore our consequences on the cross of Calvary. And He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Whoever believes in Me. God loved the world so much that He gave His Son. So whoever believes in Him. So I can look you in the eye this morning, friend, and say, I don't know whether you're saved or not, but I know that Christ died for you. And if you believe, He will forgive you. He will save you. And you won't have to worry about God finding you guilty. Because your name will be written down. Your name will be there. And God will grant you access into His presence for eternity. Because He loves Jesus enough to do that for you. But... The expectation that we have, friends, 
is to continue to live the way that God wants us to, so that we may, as he says in chapter 2, verse 5, know that we can have that confidence that we are in Jesus because we are experiencing his power. We are living the way that he wants us to. And when we don't, things don't feel right. There is something off. There is something broken. That doesn't mean you lose it. A lot of us sometimes can have that struggle. We don't feel like things are going right. We don't feel saved. Feelings aren't irrelevant. But when Satan calls me to despair, tells me of the guilt within, the hymn writer says, Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. Why? Because God the just is satisfied to look on Jesus and pardon me. That's our hope. That's how we know. We don't look at all the inconsistencies and the failures that we have. We look back to Jesus. When we look at Jesus, we also look and see, what does He want me to do? How does He want me to live? We experience peace with God in the depths of our soul. A peaceful society, a perfect soul, a perfect spirit before God that gives us ultimately the positive settlement so that we can have that confidence that in the time of judgment, We are not justified by works, as Paul says in Galatians 2.16, but we are justified through faith, through believing in Jesus Christ. But the whole book of Galatians is, yes, we're justified by faith, but God wants us to live under the instruction of the law, fulfill Christ's righteousness. So what does he say in Galatians 2.20? A verse that we quoted, I think, the last three weeks now. I am crucified with Christ." Yet, it is no longer I who live, but instead it is Christ who lives in me. The life I am now living in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And the Son of God living through me doesn't look reckless, doesn't look scattered. Instead, He is living out the righteousness of Christ. He is living in a way that is going to make him a good neighbor. Is going to make him a good spouse or her a good spouse. He's going to make him a good parent, a good child. This is how God wants us to live. This is how God wants us to work. The empowerment of His Spirit within us that enables us to live by the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Crucified that part that Paul was talking about early in Romans that keeps wanting us to do this. We keep putting those things to death with the passions, with the desires. And so, Paul says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That means it's a personal, everyday process of putting these things out. You can't just say, I'm saved. I'm not going to hell anymore. Cruise control. No. It's realizing, yes, we have the struggles. We have the weaknesses. God gives us the strength to say no. So keep yourself connected to His Word. Keep faithful in prayer. Keep yourself encouraged and accountable with the saints here. One of the tragedies, I think, of American evangelicalism and where we find ourselves even today as a church is we have a lot of people here right now at this hour. But a lot of the other times where we're living life together, we see it in small groups, we see it in classes, we see it on Wednesday nights, people are like, ah, I'm too busy. I'm too busy for these things. And then we wonder, why do we struggle with the consequences of sin? Why do we struggle with all these things? And I would say at least part of that, friends, is this. Because we fooled ourselves into thinking, I can just read a book, listen to a podcast, 
listen to some good music, and that's going to keep me close with God. Where none of those things are bad, but what God tells us in His Word, the Christian needs, is the fellowship of the saints. It's being part of His body. It's learning His truth together. It's praying with one another, breaking bread with each other, keeping things accountable, confessing our faults to one another. Americans say, I don't need that. That's that's too personal. That's too uncomfortable. I'm going to do other things. And we wonder why we have such struggles. We wonder why we have such difficulties. It's Because God told us one way and we're trying to do it our own way. Rely on His Spirit. Take advantage of what He's given to you so that you can have His love perfected in you. Don't be like Felix who was uncomfortable when he was confronted by the truth. Embrace the truth. Live the truth. Put on display the righteousness of Jesus. Do it before your fellow Christians so that you can do it together to make Jesus exalted to a watching world.